For about 100 dollars more than the Tough B3600, you can get the Asus RT-B88U, which is a sort of mid-range Wi-Fi 7 router that also doesn't support the 6 GHz radio band, but it does have some features that may or may not compensate for this major deficiency. There is support for multilink operation where you can aggregate the two existing radio bands for a potentially better throughput and range, but perhaps the most interesting new additions are the 10 gigabit Ethernet port and the 10 gigabit SFP Plus slot. Don't get me wrong, it makes perfect sense considering the price tag of the device, but we finally managed to get above 2.5 gigabit since it was a major bottleneck for the Wi-Fi 7 true potential. Now, whether the Asus RT-B88U is capable to actually cross this limit is another story. We will find out very soon, in the testing section. Other features that are worth mentioning are the powerful chipset, the 2 gigabits of RAM, the AI Protection Pro and there has also been some improvements towards how the AI Mesh functions. Now we get the AI powered smart AI Mesh which can apparently leverage multilink operation to switch between bands to find the most suitable one for data transmission. All this would be interesting in practice, so let's get a closer look at the router. Design-wise, the Asus RT-B88U is very similar to the RT-AX88U Pro, with the only notable difference being the golden piece around the logo. The RT-AX88U Pro is also identical to the RT-AX88U, which also closely resembles the RT-AC88U, so it's a long line of devices with very little changes in terms of design and looks. The case remains large and the two side antennas do increase the footprint even more, but we do get the option to mount the router on the wall, right? Not in the traditional sense, no. There are two silicone covers which hide what looks like mounting holes, but there is no canal where to hook up the router on the screw head. It's flat. I mean, you can still hang the router, just be careful not to bump into it or accidentally yank a cable, otherwise it will tumble to the floor. On the front side we get to see the status LEDs and I'm happy with the developer's decision to not go with the minimalist but incredibly confusing single multicolored LED. There are no other buttons or ports here or on the sides, everything else can be found on the rear side of the router. From the left we get the 10 gigabit one LAN port, followed by an SFP Plus slot that supports 10 gigabit modules. Then there's the WPS button which sits next to the 8 LAN ports. The first four are 2.5 gigabit, while the last are gigabit only. And also I need to mention that the first port is WAN LAN, while the fourth is a gaming port, so connecting a gaming device to it will automatically give it a higher priority. Lastly, there's the reset button, the USB 3.0 port, the DC in port and the power button. The type of case that Asus went for with the RTB88U has proven over the years to be successful at pushing the heat away from the inner components. There are lots of ventilation openings all around, including at the front and top side, so it should be enough for it to remain at a decent temperature, right? I did use a thermal camera to show you the thermal management of the router, and I had to include two types of footage, one for Fahrenheit, the other for Celsius, since I had some complaints that the conversion cannot be done easily. And apparently the router does get heated up a bit more than its predecessor although I doubt it will lead to thermal throttling. I did open the Asus RT-B88U in a separate video and it was a very difficult process. There are four screws on the rear side hidden by silicone covers and one screw has a warranty seal glued on top of it. It's more of a scare tactic in the US, but in other countries I would be very careful that the warranty can be voided by a small fragile piece of paper that holds no functional value for the router itself. Funny how these things work. The PCB is large enough to cover most of the inner side and there are three heat spreaders to push the heat away from the main chipsets. You can have a closer look at the main components, but I did go through them a bit quicker, so either pause or check the dedicated video for a slower pace. At the end I had to also include a comparison table with other similar wireless routers. 
Now let's talk about the wireless performance of the router. You can see it from the graphic, there are two new elements. Besides the usual Wi-Fi 6 and Wi-Fi 5 client devices, I also ran the same single client throughput test using a Wi-Fi 7 client device. It's the same one that I had to use to test the multilink operation performance as well. Since there are only the 5 GHz and the 2.4 GHz radios available, I could aggregate these two and there is an improvement in terms of throughput. And it has as much of an impact even at 70 feet, where the signal attenuation is much more of a burden. I didn't include it in the signal attenuation graphic because I registered two simultaneous values from the two radios, as expected. You can also have a look at the values downstream. Okay, I do enjoy seeing the throughput reaching almost 2 gigabits per second, but the Asus RTB88 u has a 10 gigabit Ethernet port, and I did connect a 10 gigabit server to it, so there was no bottlenecking, this is the max performance that the router can offer. When compared to other wireless routers, we can see that while using the 160MHz channel bandwidth, it offers the best performance, and not only when relying on the multilink operation. But things do change a bit when using the 80MHz channel with the TUF AX4200 taking the top spot this time. At the end I also added a long term throughput performance graphic with a comparison with another Wi-Fi 7 router from Asus, the TUF B3600, and there are some interesting patterns. Let's also have a look at the 2.4 GHz radio throughput. I made sure to set it to use the 40 MHz channel with, and the throughput is fine, but not necessarily impressive. I mean, you can see that other routers did much better here. Then again, it's worth mentioning the range of the router, that even if the single attenuation was more than 70 dB, we still get very much usable throughput for most applications. That's about all for the single client test for now, so let's fire up the Net Hydra tool and run the usual set of latency tests on the 5 client devices that I always use for this type of test. Starting up with the simulated 1080p streaming, we can see that the two Wi-Fi 5 clients did not perform well, while the Wi-Fi 7 and the Wi-Fi 6 devices did much better, one of them managing to stay below 60 milliseconds for 95% of the time. Running the 4K streaming test, the three aforementioned clients did better again, but I could only consider decent latency what we see for 75% of the time. Anything above 100 milliseconds is not good. But I did not stop here and included intense browsing as well, which I ran alongside the 1080p streaming traffic. And we can see that one of the three clients did fail to stay below 100 milliseconds, while one Wi-Fi 6 laptop and the Wi-Fi 7 PC managed to stay below 100 milliseconds for at least 95% of the time. The rest performed much worse, which means that it would be better to rely on the Ethernet ports and we do get plenty of them. The intense browsing graphic shows that the latency on all 5 client devices stays below 1.5 seconds all the time, so all is fine here. Now let's run the intense browsing traffic alongside the 4K streaming. And it's definitely a slaughter. All clients immediately rose above 100 milliseconds, some even passing 1 second for about 1% of the time. Don't even think about running something similar. The intense browsing graphic shows that one client went above 1.5 seconds, which is not good, but the rest did remain below this limit. Moving on, I changed things a bit and included simulated downloaded traffic of a 10 megabyte file on two client devices, two handle the intense browsing and one the 4K streaming. We can see that the Wi-Fi 7 client was relatively contained, more so than the Wi-Fi 6 downloading client that passed one second for at least 5% of the time. The 4K streaming shows latency values above 200 milliseconds, which is far from decent, but the two intense browsing clients did fairly okay. Let's limit the load a bit by running the download traffic on a single client, and while things got better in terms of latency for the downloading client, I doubt anyone would be happy with a 200 plus milliseconds latency. The two 4K streaming clients did not offer decent latency values, but the two intense browsing did, as was anticipated. Let's now go a bit lighter and run the downloading traffic alongside just a 4K streaming client and one that's running intense browsing. The downloading latency did not get much better, and the only client with acceptable values remains the intense browsing device. So I decided to download a 1 megabyte file continuously while running intense browsing and voice over IP on the other two client devices. And as expected, this is the point where we finally see decent latency values across the board. Lastly, I decided to run the 10 megabyte downloading traffic on all 5 client devices, and this is the result. I honestly expected worse. 
Before moving forward, I also wanted to show you the values that I collected running Flant to check for buffer bloat. And I initially ran it on the 5GHz radio only to get a base latency. While using the 80 MHz channel bandwidth, we do see an initial rise, but then the average latency does calm down, although above 100 milliseconds, nevertheless. Moving on to the 160 MHz channel bandwidth, we see some crazy numbers, the average moving above and below 500 milliseconds. This was on channel 60, so I moved to 44. Things get a tiny bit better, but not by much, really. This kind of confirms the issues I had previously with the multi-client latency values. The Asus RT B8080U is not that great in this regard. In any case, I also ran Flant after I set up the multi-link operation. Using the 160MHz channel bandwidth and the 40MHz width with the 2.4GHz radio, we see better average latency values. Still lots of fluctuations though, and a far cry from the values I got when I tested the Ubiquiti U7 Pro and the Zyxeon WA-130BE multi-link operation performance. That's a much better implementation of multilink operation and we also get the 6 GHz radio band. Using the 80 MHz channel bandwidth on the 5 GHz radio and the same 40 MHz for the 2.4 GHz radio band, we also see an improvement in terms of average latency. But again, these are very high values and lots of fluctuations, which is a sign of instability. Hopefully some future updates will make things more stable. Now let's move forward and put all those Ethernet ports to good use. First, I'm going to check out the dual one performance and to enable this feature go to WAN, choose dual WAN and simply enable it. Then you can choose the primary WAN or the secondary WAN and you can also select any of the available ports including the SFP Plus and the 1 gigabit ports. There is also support for USB dongles. The supported modes are failover and load balance. I chose the former and after connecting the cables I pinged two domains at the same time. Then I disconnected the main link. It took a couple of tries to switch the secondary connection which is better than what I saw on the TAF B3600. I reconnected the main line, waited a few seconds and disconnected the secondary cable. It very quickly moved to the main line, so it works as intended. The next application is the LACP aggregation which seems to be missing from some other models, but the 88U line is usually better equipped. So to enable it, head over to the LAN section, select switch control and enable the bonding link aggregation. Wait a few seconds and you can now use the LAN1 and LAN2 to connect an S. I relied on a Zima Blade SBC that was flashed with true NAS and I had some trouble getting everything to work. I assumed that the NAS was flimsy, but I was wrong. After troubleshooting for a couple of hours and setting up the NAS from the ground up, I realized that it was the Asus router. Even though it said that the LAN 1 and LAN 2 were aggregated, they were not. And I needed about 3 reboots and complete interface reconfiguration to confirm it. We can now see in the TrueNAS graphical interface that we get up to 5 gigabits per second available, so the aggregation indeed took place. But what about the speed? I decided to run an iPerf instance and as you can see upstream we can see that it reaches up to 2.5 gigabits per second. Same as downstream. I also need to mention the router's ability to aggregate to one links, but unfortunately I do not have a compatible modem to test it out. I also can't really max the switching capacity of the router with my current equipment, so I will leave it to a future retest. Before moving to the software section, let's see the power consumption of the router. I use the same app associated with the smart relay and you can see the values while the router is in normal use. This is not the maximum power consumption. Now let's have a quick look at the web-based interface. The layout is the same we got for many years, with some general settings as well as the advanced ones on the left side. I do need to mention the revamped AI mesh section and I will test multilink operation with more than one Asus routers very soon, especially since the developers insist that they made things much smoother. Then there's the Guest Network Pro where you can configure various types of networks including one dedicated to IoT, multilink operation and there's even one suitable for kids. The AI protection is as comprehensive as ever and we do get some gaming focused features. You may have noticed that what the fast is missing and that has been the case for a while now. It's because it's a separate service which can be used by relying on an app. I'm not fond of extra apps and subscriptions but you do you. The advanced settings section is comprehensive as always 
and we have already went through some of the available features there, such as the dual one, the one aggregation and the LACP aggregation. The support for VPNs is also very nice and there is the firewall section as well. I suppose I do need to mention the VLAN section under WLAN as well, because this is where you can associate ports to the guest networks. There is support for Amazon Alexa, but I wouldn't touch it if you care about your privacy. The layout of the app remains the traditional one, with the home page showing some internet status info as well as the AI mesh configuration and the mobile game mode which automatically prioritizes the mobile device. Then there's the devices where we can set up the quality of service priority as well as enable the safe browsing based on the preset profiles which do include ad blocking. It's nice to see that Asus has acknowledged the current extremely invasive nature of the ads. The family section remains the same as what we saw on other Asus routers, offering between age-based presets the option to set up scheduled internet access and select what type of content will be blocked. Of course, this is a part of the Trend Micro suite of features that's embedded within the Asus WRT, and there is some data collection that's happening in the background as well. Then we get to see the settings section which covers most of what we get on the web-based interface, but a bit less in depth. As we reach the conclusion, I have to say that the 10 gigabit ports can be a bit misleading, raising the expectation that along with the Wi-Fi 7 label, we would get a phenomenal Wi-Fi throughput. And that's not at all the case. Don't get me wrong, the multi operation works decently well in the sense that the throughput can go past 2 gigabits per second, although the latency is a bit strange. And that also came forward in the multi-client test as well, which means that some additional work needs to be done here. That being said, is the price tag justified? Right now it stays between $350 and $400, so it is a bit pricey. A Ubiquiti U7 Pro access point offers a better performance and it does support multi-link operation while also costing less. But if you add a gateway and a 10 gigabit switch, you'll easily go past $500. I mean, it's probably worth it, but it's up to you to decide. I would also keep an eye on the Asus RT-B92U, which should be out soon and will have most of the features of the B88U plus the 6GHz radio. That's all for now, thank you for watching and see you next time.